Well, I'm delighted to welcome everyone to our next session, a very highly anticipated session on a discussion on trading strategies with two technical pros. At this time, I would like to introduce both of our speakers to the stage. Our first presenter today is John Bollinger, who is the president of Bollinger Capital Management, a firm that provides money management and proprietary technical analysis research. Mr. Bollinger is the creator of Bollinger Bands, which are utilized worldwide for analyzing the financial markets. His book, Bollinger on Bollinger Bands, has been translated into 12 languages. Mr. Bollinger's website, www.bollingerbands.com, is the hub for everything related to Bollinger Bands. And I'm also delighted to welcome our next pres presenter to the stage. Mike Moody is a longtime chartered market technician. He is a former editor of the Journal of Technical Analysis and has also authored several papers on relative strength. He headed, he headed the money management arm of large registered investment advisors for 20 years and continues to manu manage accounts today. John, Mike, it's a pleasure to welcome you both. The stage is yours to begin the session. Good morning. Um, a couple of years ago, Money Show invited Marvin Appel of Signaler to interview me in a sort of casual format. And that interview turned into a conversation because I was really interested in the work that he did as well as his interest in, in my work. And so this is the sort of the next iteration of that conversation. Today, I'm joined by my friend and portfolio manager, Mike Moody, whose specialty is relative strength. And we're gonna talk a little bit about relative strength. We'll talk a little bit about Bollinger Bands. We'll talk about how the two disciplines can be combined together. And the theme here will be practical applications of how people really get things done in this business. Um, so with that, um, Mike, why don't you um, start with a few words about relative strength? Well, I, I think relative strength is among technicians fairly well known, but it's often confused with RSI, which is something completely different. Um, true relative strength is just a measurement of an instrument relative to the market. It's, it's very simple to measure. It works in a lot of formulations. So you can see um, cases where they'll simply take the price of an instrument, let's say Pfizer, divide it by the S&P, plot that line. Uh, so you can get a line and, and lots of uh, outfits like SRC have made those charts for years and years and years. Um, you can also rank things, you know, go through and tile the market. So do it cross-sectionally. You can look at uh, something, you know, the price of Pfizer relative to its price 50 days ago, or the, you know, five-day moving average relative to the 150-day moving average, or any of those kinds of formulations work. It works across a lot of markets worldwide. It works across a lot of instruments, futures, uh, you know, equities, all, you know, you can rank sectors, you can look at a market cross-sectionally. Uh, it, it's an extremely versatile tool. And the most useful thing about it is it's the best performing single factor. If you look at, let's say Ken French's website where he has a, a a free and open to the public uh, database of, of factors. So it, it's extremely useful. And that, as you point out, that is one way that professionals get things done by paying attention to the relative strength of what they own. So I, I know that for individual investors, a lot of people are worried about the sort of rapidity of trading that some relative strength approaches um, generate. Uh, obviously it can be fine tuned to whatever um, frequency you like. But one of the big questions that, that uh, individual investors tend to end up asking is about tax efficiency. They say, well, it's so much turnover, aren't, aren't I gonna be generating a lot of tax consequences in my account if I follow a relative strength approach? I've seen that concern many times, but in fact, what happens in, in the course of managing accounts like this for 20 years, and, and we happen to use a, a long-term point and figure relative strength approach. Um, it turns out that when things don't work, they tend not to work 
fairly quickly. So you end up with some short-term capital losses. When things do work, they often work well and for a long time. So you have long-term capital gains. Many of the holding periods are multiple years. We found that the holding period averaged about 18 months to two years. So no, in fact, there isn't that much turnover and it ends up being very tax efficient because your long-term gains uh, often are somewhat offset by the short-term losses in terms of the realized gains and losses any given year. Hmm. So one of the themes that I wanted to focus on today is this idea of first principles of the, the basic operating principles of the markets relative strength is, is obviously um, one of those, but you just touched on another one, point and figure. Um, can you give us a little bit of an idea how point and figure can help in the relative strength approach? We found it useful in the sense that relative strength charted in an orthodox way with the, you know, like a three box reversal type of method um, filters out a lot of the noise. And when we were managing money, we were using, um, you know, just the relative strength line end of day plotted on a six and a half percent chart with a three box reversal. That's almost a 20% reversal in relative performance to even reverse columns on a point figure chart, let alone create a buy or sell signal. So it actually creates a lot of latitude and because it filters out a lot of the noise, as you point out, one of those important things in um, trying to make actual money is knowing that you're trading the signal and not the noise. And it does filter a great deal of the noise out. Yeah, that's, I, I think, important. Actually, I want to pick up on one thing you just said, and that is um, the latitude that it creates. Bollinger Bands um, are a set of lines drawn in and around the price structure, um, a moving average in, in an upper limit and a lower limit. Um, and they define whether the price is high or low on a relative basis, can be used in almost any instrument as, as can relative strength, um, and can be used in, in, in most any time frame. Um, that, was, um, that was really important. Um, to, to, to understand that it can be combined with other approaches and other indicators. So for example, if, if one is running a relative strength portfolio, um, one can use Bollinger Bands to help with that portfolio. How could that be? Um, so you have a list of the strongest stocks, the, the stocks that, that you own in, in your portfolio. And this point and figure approach is creating some latitude, is giving those stocks some time to move around. Well, by adding Bollinger Bands into the puzzle, you can identify places where you want to add to those positions. You can identify places where you might want to take some weight away from those positions if they're overweight in the, in the portfolio. It gives you a frame of reference that's different from relative strength, but complementary. I think that's, you know, was the theme of what I really wanted to talk about today is, is how we can take these different technical approaches and combine them together to produce, you know, superior results for our clients. I think it's a good point, John, and, and it's Bollinger Bands can be complementary, not just to relative strength, but almost to any technical approach can be used with a wide range of indicators. Um, we find in, in relative strength, if you take a value portfolio, let's say, and combine it with relative strength, it performs better than the value portfolio alone. So it's the same kind of thing where a lot of these tools can be additive uh, when, they're, when they're put together. Yeah. We have a question here, Mike. Somebody's asking about that Ken French uh, website that you, uh, that, that you mentioned. Could you... Uh... Tell them about that again. Uh, yes, it was at, it's um, Ken French's website at Dartmouth. 
It's um, publicly available. There's a huge amount of data on factors, um, relative strength, value, uh, you name it. Um, he's, he's the collaborator with Eugene Fama of the famous Fama French, uh, you know, work in fundamental analysis. The interest, the most interesting thing to um, me about the data on that website is that although relative strength is far and away the best performing factor, um, Ken French and Eugene Fama refer to it as an anomaly and, and prefer value. Um, it just doesn't actually <laughs> perform as well, so. Well, the interesting thing is they give it a different name too. They don't call it relative strength, they call it momentum, which I think is a misnomer for what's actually going on. I think that's right. I think academics believe momentum was discovered by an academic in 1991 when the first academic paper about it was written. <laughs> um, but in fact, as you know, you know, things like SRC had been publishing charts for Mansfield, uh, Chartcraft, you know, tons of technical purveyors had been providing relative strength charts for a long time and had been written about. At least from the 30s, huh? I think from the 1890s. Yeah. 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 Long, long, long time. Technical factor. Hey, Mike, it's uh, Jordan, your moderator. You're coming, your audio is coming in a little bit light. Would you mind speaking up just a little bit? Thank you so much. Yeah, try that. Yeah, just if you could speak up just a little bit, that, that'd be awesome. Back to you, John. Modern technology, you know, it's um, <laughs> hoax that yeah. you a little bit. So I, I go back to Bollinger Bands for a little bit. There are, are two helper indicators um, that um, are very commonly used with Bollinger Bands. The first one's percent B, which simply tells us where we are in relation to the Bollinger Bands. It's one when we're at the upper band and zero when we're at the lower band. So in, in a relative strength framework, you know, one, one can think about taking weight away at, at the upper limit and, and adding at the lower limit. But there's another helper indicator that, that we haven't touched on yet that I think is very useful in this regard. And that is bandwidth. Um, bandwidth is simply a measure of how wide the Bollinger Bands are at any given point in time. It's the distance from the upper band to the lower band um, divided by the value of the middle band. Um, those of you who um, are statistically adept will recognize that it's four times the coefficient of variation um, for uh, uh, given the standard parameters for Bollinger Bands. But if you plot bandwidth over time, one of the things that we, we, we find out is that trends tend to emerge from very low levels of bandwidth um, and trends tend to end at very high levels of bandwidth, specifically when bandwidth rolls over from, from a very high level. That gives you another way of, of managing uh, exposure within a relative strength approach. Uh, you can um, pick up uh, items when, when, when bandwidth is really low. If you have some feeling that, that the, the, you know, the relative strength is strong relative to the, to the rest of the market, um, it's an opportunity because a, a very low bandwidth is a forecast for increased volatility. And, and if, if you have a trendy market, then um, items that you buy at that stage of the game are, are gonna benefit you. And likewise, at the, on the other side of it, um, often what you get in relative strength is, is things get very overbought um, and then they, they pull back or consolidate. And what will happen is that the beginning of those consolidations, um, bandwidth will roll over. So it, it'll alert you um, to those sorts of consolidations. In fact, uh, um, uh, Mike and I have a common friend who sits around and waits for those sorts of consolidation. He calls them relative strength pivots and um, that's all he trades. Uh, so uh, you can see that there can be a real synergy here between the, the different parts and pieces that adds up to more than the value of the individual parts and pieces. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I think um, one thing that I think might be useful too that you can't always see as clearly from a relative strength chart uh, are kind of price patterns, which you can often identify using bands. 
and 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 you know maybe you can talk just a little bit about you know where bands came from and and why the why the fact that they're so adaptive is so helpful well bands were the answer to a problem um back in the early very early 80s when i became active as market technician um we used fixed width trading bands. It's simply a moving average and you shifted it up by some percentage and shifted it down by a, a similar percentage. Um, for example, for the Dow, um, we used a 21 period moving average and shifted it up four and a half percent and down four and a half percent. And then we compared it to a, to, to a couple of indicators. And if you tag the upper band and one of those indicators was negative, you use that as a sell alert. If you tag the lower band and one of those indicators was positive, you use that as a buy alert. But you know what you'd find is is at important junctures, you know the the price action might not might or might, you know, not fit that nine percent um, envelope that 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 you had created around price. When prices were very volatile, the envelope would be too narrow, and you have to reset it wider. And if the prices were were were, were very calm, the band be too wide, and you have to reset it narrower. And what would happen is a really interesting thing. You'd let your emotions into the trading process when you reset those bands. If, if you were bullish, um, you would um, draw the picture to, to present a bull, bullish picture. And if you were bearish, you'd set the bandwidth to present a bearish picture. So it was really a problem. And um, I was an option trader at the time. I was looking for a way to automate those the, the setting of, of, of the width of the bands. And uh, one day I had an early computer, um, of, we called it microcomputers at the time, um, running a very early version of a spreadsheet. And one day I copied the formula for volatility down a column. Um, and volatility is a first principle um, item of, of the market. We talked a little bit about first principles before. And I saw that volatility was changing over time, which, which was unheard of at, at the time. We believe that vol volatility at the time was fixed, like a, the house is wide or the sky is blue, something something like that. IBM vol volatility, it's beta, which is a measure of volatility, 1.2 um, period. And you, you know you measured it once a year um, using five years worth of weekly data. You just, you just didn't feel you needed to do it anymore. But I, I looked at volatility and it was changing a lot in the short term. I've been looking for something to make trading bands adaptive. And it turned out that, that volatility was, was, was the perfect key. Um, and there, there had been um, some other efforts in, in, in that regard to try to make, make adaptive bands, but using standard deviation, which is the power powerhouse behind Bollinger Bands, turns out, at least for, for my approach and my work, to, to be the, the, the best way. So when, when you have things that are adaptive like that, that's why we talked about bandwidth a little bit earlier. You know, the bands will get very, very tied together in, in, at some stages and, and they get spread very apart. Big, big uptrend or big downtrend spread, spread, spread them really widely. And there's a tremendous amount of information in that. Just as there's a tremendous amount of information in the relative strength line. Um, so the, it, it's just a, a sort of natural combination um, to be able to, to combine the, the approaches. Yeah, I think some of the interesting information that you see in a relative strength line that you don't necessarily see in price is there are periods where you see the price on the chart going up and the relative strength line rolls over and starts down. And even mm -hmm. though the price is still going up in absolute terms, you can see it's starting to lag and, and there are places where the money is going to do better than, than uh, you know, that particular item. So in, in that situation where you have relative strength lagging, ro rolling over like that, if you know, price gets strong enough to, to tag the upper band, that, that's a you know, perfect place to do some trimming, uh, um, such like that. And the opposite case is where you have increasing relative strength to get down to the lower band, that's a perfect place to do some adding and, and such. Right. So the, the, the ability to create these synergistic approaches, um, I think is something that separates um, many pros from um, uh, many amateurs. Amateurs tend to focus on, on, on you know, kind of monochromatically on, on, on one approach. The other mistake that, that we find that amateurs often make 
and I, I mean amateurs in, in the best possible sense, not pros, not, no, 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 no sense of you know, pointing down um, at them, is that they overcomplicate. They, they have, uh, um, you know, they, they make you know, very complicated decision rules, uh, um, many parts and pieces, very complicated systems and approaches. Whereas pros tend to focus on much simpler um, ideas um, and because there's much less noise and it, you, you're not getting caught up in curve fitting. Um, typically a mistake that's made um, is putting in way too many rules to fit a recent set of data, say the past couple of years or something like that. And then finding, finding out that it doesn't match um, the next couple of years at all. Yeah, I think it's very true that simplicity is really important. Being systematic is really important. Um, all of those kinds of things that the, the simpler you can make it. And I think that's one of the things about both relative strength and, and Bollinger bands is they're as simple as possible, but no simpler, right? <laughs> the, the, the basic Occam's razor <laughs> formulation. That's very funny. You know, it, it's um, if you go back in the history of technical indicators, you find um, that there are, are you know a half a dozen or or, or, or may, maybe a dozen indicators, and then you know if you look at all the rest of the indicators, and there are hundreds of them now. I mean, literally hundreds and hundreds of them. They're all variations on that on that original indicator set. And right. one of the things I I did years ago, I was trying to organize. I used to have a website called Equity Trader. One of the things I did years ago, I, I tried to organize the indicators um, in groups by the tasks that they were meant to accomplish. Uh, momentum, um, overbought, oversold, um, accumulation and distribution from volume perspective, and et cetera. And, and I found that in, inevitably in each of those categories, there were one or two core indicators. And typically they were, they, typically they were old. Um, you know, 50, 60 years old or, or um, more than that. And then there were a lot of other indicators that were refinements, modifications and, and such like that. So, uh, but it was those original ideas that were those Occam razor sort of ideas. A nice. classic example is relative strength index, the RSI created by Wells Wilder, which compares the strength on up days to the strength on down days over time. It's, it's an essential and beautiful indicator with a lot of applications. And there, there's, I don't know, 30 versions of it out there. But if you look back to the, to the original idea, it's just that. It's the comparison of strength on up days versus comparison of weakness on down days. It, it, it's, you know, elemental idea for the market. Yeah. So I think uh, um, Jordan is poking me uh, I'm here to take, for us to take some uh, um, questions. So. Why don't we try that? Excellent. Thank you both gentlemen. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent. All right, our first question, uh, our viewer writes in, uh, John, my chart platform has Bollinger percent B. How would you use that with the Bollinger bands and bandwidth? So percent Bs, uh, um, you know, has many applications. It's often used in trading systems, you know, it, for a bit of logic, if percent B is greater than blah, 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 um, and some indicator is less than zero, then do this. Um, that, that's a really typical application for percent B. But the one that I love the best is identifying W bottoms uh, or, or price patterns, as, as Mike suggested before. So a W bottom, um, we say is a new low in price that's not a new low in percent B. Um, so you have a divergence um, between price and price in relation to the Bollinger Bands. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, our next question is for Mike and it is our viewer writes in, what are your favorite chart indicators to use to judge relative strength? What I typically use is point and figure relative strength. So like I mentioned, um, just charting the relative strength line uh, using a point and figure chart with a six and a half percent reversal, I find very useful. But even if you look at just a relative strength line with let's say a, 
a 30 period or 50 period or 100 period moving average, you get really useful information. Uh, like I said, it's useful in almost any formulation. It just depends exactly what your time frame is and how you're trying to use it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I would I would add to uh, um, what Mike said there. The relative strength line itself, if you just plot the ratio of, say, um, Pfizer might use it as an example to, to the market, let's say SPY or, or something like that, you'll find that it, it's a very jagged line. There's, there's a, a lot of noise to it. You know, it's really moves around a lot and, and it's very hard to read and such. So some smoothing, some filtering out of that high frequency information so, so that you can look at the, the longer term trends is essential. Mike uses point and figure. Um, I tend to use um, moving average of relative strength. I actually don't plot the relative strength line itself. I plot a very short term moving average of it, um, just a few just a few periods to smooth it, and then a longer moving average with it as as, as well to give me a you know a sense of, of of trend. But either way, it, it's the same same, same sort of thing. I, I just uh, um, do it that way. Exactly. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, our next question is for John. Uh, and our viewer writes in, does the Bollinger Bands tell you the price of where you should start buying a stock and how applicable are Bollinger Bands to uh, a long-term trend? So um, just two, two different questions, really. Um, Bollinger Bands can give you an indication of, of areas in which it is interesting to buy, areas which is interesting to sell, best used with other um, sorts of indicators. Um, uh, relative strength is one. But one that I really like are the, are the accumulation distribution indicators, the one, the indicators that, that, that try to get some sense of participation in term, using volume and price together. The, the original was on balance volume, which I'm, I'm not that fond of, but there are two out there. Um, one's called intraday intensity and another is called accumulation distribution. The latter was written by Barry Williams. The former was written by David Bostian. Um, and those are, are very useful to, you know, get get down to the tag of the lower band. Do I want to buy here? And you consult those indicators would be very helpful. Same, same, same on the upside. Um, and I forget the second half of the question. It's, it's okay. We're, we're going to jump to our next one. Uh, do you use money flow indicator? Yeah, that, that's just what I meant. Volume indicators, accumulation distribution. Uh, yeah, those are essentially yeah. money flow indicators. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, MFI is actually interesting. It's one of those variants I talked about before. Um, the RSI, the relative strength index for comparison of up, up um, prices on up days to prices on down days. There's another indicator called MFI, the money flow index, that compares, that incorporates volume into that um, puzzle. Um, it's, it's just RSI plus volume, essentially. So th there's an example of, of how an indicator's um, been taken and, and, and modified over the years to produce a, a, a differently useful tool. Excellent, thank you. Our, our next viewer is actually Marvin Appel and he writes in, thank you both for an excellent presentation. And he's wondering, uh, does Mike uh, publish, have any published books or article about his work on relative strength? Um, there was one that appeared in the SEMA publication um, there was one that appeared in technical analysis of stocks and commodities, I want to say maybe 2007, 2003, I'd have to look it up. But yes, there's stuff out there. Excellent. Thank you. Um, our next question is for John. Hi, Marvin. <laughs> thank you, John. Um, our, our next viewer writes in, have you done any work using the length of time between a tag of either outer band as a signal? Read that to me again, please. Absolutely. Uh, our viewer is wondering, have you done any work using the length of time between a tag of either outer band as a signal? How, John, how would you characterize BB persist? Oh, well, there you go. Um, so BB persist is an indicator that does take a bullish band indicator that does take time into account what it does is over a window, a, a typical, I, I use uh, either 50 periods or 125 periods. Um, 
it counts the number of tags of the upper band and the number of tags of the lower band gives some idea of the strength of, of the market overall. Um, so that's a time window application of Bollinger Bands. I'm not sure that it's response to the question, but um, it's a very interesting indicator in any case. Very helpful. Thank you very much, John. Um, uh, gentlemen, our next viewer writes in, what platform does the best point, the best point and figure charts? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I, I use uh, Dorsey Wright's platform, but there are others. You can create perfectly wonderful point and figure charts on stockcharts.com as well. I'm sure there are other platforms that I'm not aware of, but it's a, a fairly widely available uh, charting method. Yeah, it's been around for a long time. All of the technical platforms have some variation uh, on it available. Um, it just depends on, on what you like the best. The thing I always uh, suggest is just go around, and try the different platforms. They all have... Um, you know, freebies uh, um, so that you can take a look at the, at, at the stuff. And, yeah. you know, after you try three or four of them, you, you, you'll you find out that you've learned a tremendous amount, amount about yourself and what you're trying to do, not so much yeah. about the platforms. Excellent. All right. We're down to our final two questions. Our first one's for John. Uh, and the viewer writes in, uh, will there be an updated edition of your Bollinger Bands book for this year or next? I don't know about this year or next. I am working on one. Um, I've been type, type, typing away. Um, it's um, actually sort of an addendum to, to, to Bollinger on Bollinger Bands. Uh, um, fleshes out some research we've done. In, in, and it's sort of like a teaching guide um, as well. So it's in the process, it, but it's been in the process for a few years now. So <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't chase it up. I would point out that um, in... Um, at 11.40 Pacific, 2.40 um, um, East, East Coast time, uh, Zoe Bollinger um, is going to be on to talk about an approach that incorporates relative strength um, ESG in an impact investing approach that's a multidisciplinary approach that's very, very much akin to some of the ideas we talked about today. Excellent. And just for, just for a reminder to the audience, uh, what John was referencing there is Zoe Bullinger, who is John's daughter, uh, will be on speaking live at the Money Show Virtual Expo today at 2.40 p.m. to 3.10 p.m. And she'll be speaking on socially responsible and profitable uh, finding a balance in ESG investing. So you'll, you'll definitely want to catch that presentation today. Uh, and our final question is from Mike. And our viewers want to know, what is the best way to follow you uh, in your research and your work? Now I have a pretty low profile. <laughs> so maybe the really, maybe the money show. <laughs> yeah, that might be it. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure hosting both of you today at the money show, and I know our audience would love for you guys to stick around for longer, but that is all the time we have for today. So I want to thank you so much for your time and joining us here at the money show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Absolutely. Drew.